Welcome back to our workshop. A few years ago, I filmed my first wood turning commission, and that was to reproduce an antique table leg. At the time, I felt I didn't have any experience I could share with you, but I've had a second thought. I want to share with you my experience learning a new skill that has now become a part of my furniture repair business. I hope you enjoy some of the successes and mistakes that I made through this project, and I'd love to hear your feedback once you see the final table leg. I'm also going to share with you an invention I've been working on. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. What I need to do is take that apart, repair it, and put it back together so I can get this chair in working order. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. I was at a customer's home inspecting their 12 foot long table. It had a sag in the middle. And the solution they were looking for was adding a fifth leg right in the center of that table. So they've given me one of the existing legs and asked me to turn something similar. Now there's some beautiful hand carving here and they weren't interested in that, but the overall shape and dimensions and color need to be very similar. So I've got this massive mahogany blank that I've made up and I'm gonna be putting it on a lathe and turning it to get it very similar to this. I'll show you the process of how I prepare it for the lathe, how I go through the turning process, and how I finish this and get it ready to be mounted on that table. Now the first thing I need to do is lay out this on the blank. I've got a split across here on this particular board, so I want to avoid that defect. So if I put this leg here, it's going to avoid that large split. Let me just rotate that and you can see. So the turning will start down here, it will end up here. I've got just over 24 inches, I need to get it down to 23 and a half. So I'm gonna trim a little bit off here and a little bit off here. Now this is a really large blank and this won't go through my miter saw. So I'm gonna to have to cut this by hand and I'm gonna be using a brand new tool that I bought, um, still in the package, and that is a Japanese saw. If you've never used one of these before, they're very different than Western saws. Western saws are wider, thicker material, and they often have uh, an edge on them because when you cut with these, you're cutting on the push. So that needs to be very rigid. Japanese saws are different. They work on the pull, and that means the metal can be thinner, and because the metal's thinner, you're cutting less wood, which means it cuts faster. So I'm gonna be using this to trim up both ends and get it ready for the lathe. So I'm gonna take about a quarter of an inch off this end and I don't have straight edges here I can work with. I've just got this one reference point. So what I'm gonna do is make a mark here. Now, I can't go down this side because this is sticking out. So I'll just pull that to the front of the bench, take another piece of wood Lay it on there. Now I have to line up this line here with what I'm drawing down the side. This Japanese saw has got teeth that are larger on this side and smaller on this side. And this is intended for ripping, which would be cutting with the grain. And this is for cross cutting. So you have two saws in one. Now I've rolled the piece here to make sure that I'm following this line as well because I need to make sure it's following the lines on both sides to make sure I get a straight cut. With this line set here, I can now work down the front edge to make sure I've got a nice square cut.
Now corner to corner here, this is the same distance as what I've got as a swing capacity with a tool rest. So I'm going to knock off some of these corners here with my electric planer. This is where I can take it back to, but I prefer just to leave some excess. So I'll knock off these corners here and then I can put on the lathe. This blank is about 40 to 50 pounds, so I'm lifting it up here so I can get it screwed in the end. And here, I've got wedges, and this is just allows me to adjust the height of this to get it just in the right spot. Now we can lift this up and attach the faceplate. Now we bring in the tailstock, lock it down, and tighten it up. So always turn with sharp tools. I've got a one-way grinding jig here and a CBN wheel, and it makes this really, really fast. You won't believe how fast this is. Just put this in here. That's it. Sharp chisel. Now because of the weight of this, and it's going to be a little bit off center, this is going to be vibrating a fair bit uh, until I get it down to round. So it's uh, be safe, take off the jewelry, put on the PPE, and we're ready to go. There are a couple different techniques for using a spindle roughing gouge like this. One is to use it underhand where your thumb's on top. The other one that I've tried a few times but I'm not really comfortable with is overhand where you put your hand on top of the, the gouge and then move it back and forth. For some reason that just doesn't feel right for me. So I've settled into using it with my thumb up and that seems to give me better control. It's a little bit jumpy on the rough spots but once I get it down to round, it's much, much smoother and easier for me to control. My workshop is a mess. I've got wood chips all over me, all over the workshop. They're about 10 feet back in this room. What if you could prevent all this mess from happening? I'll talk about that at the end of this video. Let's move on to laying out the blank. I've laid out all the dimensions on this piece of cardboard. And the way I do that is I prop up the leg so it's level, put it on the cardboard, and then use a square to transfer the marks of each of the key components across this turning. Once I've got those down, then what I need to do is use the calipers and measure the width of each part, take it over to the ruler, get that measurement, and then write the measurement down. So this ends up giving me a bunch of lines, which are the key points on the turning, and I have dimensions for each. So I'll take that over to the blank and transfer those marks. I line this up at the bottom here where my X is, and then I can transfer the lines. Just move my tool rest over here so I can rest my pencil on it line it up, and then turn. So this way I get a line all the way around and it just helps. I'll lock that in there just to make it a little bit easier. So 
So I'm going to bring my pattern back here and you can see these lines are lined up and I've got a reference here. So on the right of this line, I need to get to three and a half. On the left of this line, I need to get to three and three quarters. And in between, I'll get to two and five eighths, but I'll leave that afterwards. So I'll work to these lines first, uh, waste away in the middle here, and then I've got my dimensions that I can start doing the cove. And work down the leg that way, all the way down to the bottom. catch on a lead like this can be really scary. To avoid that, you need to use the ABC rule. Anchor, bevel, cut. That's anchor your chisel to the tool rest, rub the bevel on the piece, and then engage the cut. That way, you'll never have a catch. This is one of many things I've learned from the American Association of Woodturners, AAW. They've also got a resource guide, Getting Started in Woodturning, something I highly recommend. I'll leave a link in the video description below. My membership with AAW also gives me newsletters that teach me about the fundamentals of wood turning. So it's a great resource. I recommend checking them out.
learned another catch. This one was caused by not using the right tool for the job. So it's important to understand all your wood turning tools and how to use them. Now there were a few spots here that I had to patch. I patched it up here with a little bit of epoxy putty. And there's also a spot here that needed some epoxy putty. I sanded this up to 400 and it's all ready to go now. What I need to do is figure out how to make this wood look like this wood. To match the existing color here, I've got some test pieces I'm going to be working up. And it's really important to make sure you go through not just staining, but also finishing. I'm using a garnet shellac here, and it's a uh, it's got a lot of color a richness to it. So it's important to make sure I see what the end product is to make my decision on which stain to use. I've got some stir sticks here, my marker to mark everything on the back, some gloves, and I'm all set to go. So I finished up the samples. This is the English chestnut, and you can see the difference between the finished and the just stained bare wood. So I realized once I got one coat of shellac on here that this isn't gonna work. The next one is the dark walnut. And here, see if I can catch it in the light, I've got two coats of shellac here. There's a band right here that's just got one coat, and then the bare stained wood. So here you can see getting much closer and there's a slight difference between one coat and two coats. So there's a bit of amber coming through in that shellac. And then this is the espresso. This one surprised me. I thought it would be way too dark, but look at how well that matches. So it's really a good idea to make sure that you do a couple different samples. So these are the two closest ones and you can see there is uh, some color difference there. Walking them through the full finishing process is important to make sure you've got the right color. So now I know what the stain is and the finish is, I can start working that up. I'm all ready to mix up my shellac now. And I start with undiluted shellac. What that is, is shellac flakes filled in the bottom of this container, and then I fill up enough denatured alcohol just to cover that. And you need to mix that up a number of times during a 24 hour period to get it mixed up. And what you end up with is a thick, syrupy looking mixture like this. Nice, rich color. And the stir stick here is made out of oak, so you can just see how rich that color is on the wood. So this is too thick to work with. This is an eight pound cut, generally when you uh, put uh, enough alcohol just to cover the flanks. I need to get it from an eight pound cut down to a two pound cut that makes it more workable. So that means if I put uh, one part uh, with the full strength shellac with three parts alcohol, that'll get me a two, to a two pound cut. So I will just use measuring spoons that way I can get a small portion. Look at that nice rich color. So there's my one part shellac. It actually does look like maple syrup in there, doesn't it? 
So there's one, two, three parts denatured alcohol. Okay, the reason I like measuring spoons is because you can see here, I've just got a little bit of finish in here. Because I'm doing repairs, I'm often working on small batches of finishes. This just helps me control that pretty well. Okay, so we'll stir that up and then we'll take it over to the table leg on the lathe. Now, just a word of caution, when you mix up shellac like this, it'll only last about six months. So you don't wanna be using an old finish because then it could remain sticky. What I do is I put a date on here when I mix it. So this is July, 2020. And that way I know when I need to get rid of this batch. Now, this is the way I put shellac on turnings. I'm not an expert at doing this. So if someone has some tips out there, I'd be glad to see them. So what I'm gonna do is this is probably gonna take uh, six or eight coats to build up the finish that is on the other leg to match it. And what I'm doing is just putting a thin coat on and because it's an alcohol finish, it flashes off very quickly. So I really only need to wait maybe 10, 15 minutes in between coats. So it goes pretty quick. that rich color starting to come to life. Now as soon as I'm done this, I take my rag and I put it in a container. What I want is to keep that alcohol on that rag to not let it dry out. So every time I use it, pull it out, as soon as I'm done, put it back inside and I can just keep reusing that. I've got eight coats of shellac on here now, and I'm really happy with the color of it. Now, as I'm going through, I put three coats on, and then I knocked it back with some steel wool. I use super fine steel wool, also known as 4 aught And after you rub that down, what you want to do is make sure you use a tack cloth as a sticky cloth to get all the particles off. Now, you can see when I hold this up here, the finish is looking pretty good. The difference here is this isn't as shiny as the shellac is. So what I need to do again is use that steel wool to knock back some of that finish and take away some of that shine. So here you can see it's more dull now than what it is up here. So it's just a matter of gently rubbing this, just light pressure with the hand and always going with the grain. So what the steel wool is doing is putting very fine scratches in the surface and it's knocking down how shiny that is. So it's just a matter of going through all the details like this and getting it to the same sheen. Before I show you the two legs side by side, what I want to do is share with you an invention I've been working on. When I filmed this video back in 2020, I was working on a prototype for a dust collection system for a lathe. It's a prototype that wasn't quite working as well. It didn't have adjustments on it, so I couldn't use it throughout the turning but I'm gonna show you what it functioned like back then. I'm sharing my whole experience of going from an idea to hopefully getting this product on the shelves on my Clean Lathe YouTube channel. You can subscribe up here on this link or you can expand the section below the video and click the link in there. When you subscribe, you get notified every time I publish a video along this journey of going from an idea to an end product. I'm gonna clean this whole mess up and get set up here and show you what until now has been impossible to do. So as you can tell, I'm a lot cleaner now. 
Now I haven't turned that much here, but I wanted to demonstrate how well this works in terms of being able to capture those chips, prevent them from flying around the room, and capturing most of them in the dust collector. There are still some that fall down here, but they're going straight down. This is the best practice in terms of dust collection for a woodworking environment. Capture dust at the source. Well, there you go. We've now got matching legs. Now, there are some slight differences. As I mentioned at the start, the customer didn't need this part here reproduced, the hand carving. So that's not reproduced here, but all the other dimensions are exactly the same. The top obviously doesn't have a roller. This will be a stationary leg and it attaches differently at the table here for the center of the table than it does at the corner. But the look, the style, the color is all the same. I'll give you a close up so you can appreciate some of the details. Let me know your thoughts on how this turning turned out. Building a new skill like wood turning might seem intimidating, but if you build the right knowledge and you've got enough experience, you will build that skill. AAW is a great resource to help you learn wood turning, and I've also had a professional wood turner in my workshop in the last year to help me refine some of the techniques I'm using and set up my lathes properly. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up, and thanks for watching Fixing Furniture.